This is NBC News Now. We're coming on the air with a sentencing for R. Kelly, the disgraced singer and convicted sex, tra sex trafficker, sentenced to 30 years in prison. Ahead, what we're hearing from his survivors of his decades of abuse. Plus, we're still digesting that explosive testimony from former White House staffer Cassidy Hutchinson. How the committee is responding to efforts by some on the right to poke holes in her story about what former President Trump was doing on the day of the Capitol attack. And the White House laying out its strategy now on how to rein in the monkeypox outbreak with thousands of doses of the vaccine headed to places with high transmission rates. The criticism it's now facing as some states are already running out of doses. Plus, we're di diving now into the dilemma faced by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, how she's balancing two core beliefs, her abortion rights stances and her Catholic faith, and how that's playing out in a fight over Holy Communion. Also, with July 4th approaching, California's governor trying to give relief money now to the millions who are hitting the road and facing high gas prices. We'll explain that later in the show. Hey there, I'm Tom Costello in for Hallie. And we start with R. Kelly, the one-time R&B superstar sentenced today to 30 years in prison after he was convicted last September of sex trafficking and racketeering. Now, survivors of that abuse are reacting to the decision outside the courthouse, saying that they are grateful for the sentence. Take a listen. I never thought that I would be here to see him be held accountable for the atrocious things that he did to children. There wasn't a day in my life up until this moment that I actually believed that the judicial system would come through for black and brown girls. And now we have justice in our judicial system. Reminder, a lot of the victims were minors. R. Kelly's trial lasted six weeks. Dozens of witnesses testifying about how he had been an abusive, toxic figure who exploited them. The jury ended up finding him guilty on all nine counts. Kelly had been dodging accusations for decades, and this trial was seen as a key moment for the Me Too movement. You'll remember now, in 2019, the docu-series Surviving R. Kelly really intensified calls for Kelly to face legal consequences, and it gave a voice to accusers who said their stories had been ignored because they were black women. Ron Allen joins me now from outside the courthouse in New York. Ron, prosecutors wanted at least 25 years for Kelly. They got more than that. Give us the details of why they went down that way and talk to us about the considerations that went into all of this. They got essentially a life sentence, which is what the prosecutors want and what the judge said Kelly deserved because of the seriousness of the charges, because she thought that the sentence needed to be a deterrent, because he showed no remorse, he accepted no responsibility for what he did. The judge was particularly stern in handing down her sentence. She said that Kelly had shown an indifference to human suffering, that he'd left a trail of broken lives in his wake. He, he said, she said to him that, that what, he had, what had happened was serial rape, sexual abuse over a long period of time. Um, so very strong language from the judge in handing down that 30-year sentence, uh, essentially meaning that Kelly will spend the rest of his life in prison. Tom? Yeah, this has been a long time coming for the survivors of this abuse. Some of them spoke before the judge gave the sentence. We heard some of what they said after the fact, but what did they say before he gave the sentence? There were some very emotional impact statements, as is the case in many sentencings in these high-profile cases. Half a dozen women and one father of one victim spoke to the court and basically said that Kelly had destroyed their lives. In very graphic terms. There are a couple of quotes that we can show you. One, a woman named, identified only as J. Doe said, I once lost hope in our justice system, but you restore my faith. A constant battle and no longer uh, do I have to live in silence. So many of the victims said that they had for so long been living in silence because they'd been, they'd been shamed. They felt that they were the cause of all this. They blamed themselves. And so they kept and suffered in silence. Another said, you are an abuser, a shameless, disgusting individual. I hope you go to jail for the rest of your life. And a third said, I can see you're not sorry. I can see you're not sorry for what you did. You're talking, he was talking while the victims were speaking. And he says, I hope you get some help and I hope you get forgiveness from God. So very emotional scene in the courtroom. Uh, women were here, uh, accusers, victims were here to try and finally get justice. Again, this has been going on for several 
many, many years, for at least a couple of decades. These allegations date back to the early 1990s. And today, with his sentencing, these women feel that they finally have gotten the measure of justice. Um, yeah, he was really a pop star, an R&B star on top of the world. Now, his lawyers were hoping for 10 years or less. So now what are they saying about going forward here? Appeal? Yeah, of course. They, they're saying that he's going to appeal. The, the, the legal part of it that they are taking exception with is the racketeering conviction. The, 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 the jury essentially found him guilty, Kelly guilty, of running a criminal enterprise that was all about his, not just his wealth and fame as a, as a musician, but also about recruiting and grooming and sexually abusing and exploiting young women and girls. Uh, they're, going to, uh, they're going to appeal that part of it, but he also has uh, uh, legal cases pending in Illinois and in Minnesota that are also sex-related cases, sex-charge-related cases. So bottom line, appeals, other cases, I think we've heard the last of R. Kelly. He's going to be in prison, I guess you could say, for, for the rest of his natural life. And again, prosecutors have been going after him for many, many years. So today there's yeah. a feeling of, of victory, but Got of it. course there's a lot a lot that was left in his wake. Yep. Um, Ron, thank you. Ron Allen in New York for us. That bombshell testimony from former White House staffer and aide to Mark Meadows, Cassidy Hutchinson, is at this hour under a microscope as the January 6th committee is opening the door for more people to testify. Tonight, Hutchinson is defending her credibility in a new statement from her attorney saying, quote, Ms. Hutchinson stands by all of the testimony she provided yesterday under oath to the select committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. This after new efforts by Republicans and other sources to poke holes in her story, starting with what she said about the Secret Service incident in the presidential motorcade. Now, a source close to the Secret Service tells NBC News that the two men in that motorcade that day dispute that the former president grabbed the steering wheel or assaulted an agent, as Hutchinson testified. But they are not denying that Mr. Trump was angry and demanded that they drive him to the Capitol. Meanwhile, both a spokesman for Mark Meadows and an attorney for Rudy Giuliani are denying that they had sought a presidential pardon. And we're also watching for who will be now talking to the committee. Who's coming up next? Congresswoman Liz Cheney today renewing her calls for former White House counsel Pat Cipollone to come before the committee after Hutchinson said he was concerned about the legal implications if the president went down to the Capitol on January 6th. And the testimony from Jeannie Thomas, whom committee members have already requested, is now in question. Her lauder, lawyer, rather, pushing back in a letter to the committee, asking for a, quote, better justification for Jeannie Thomas to appear. Joining me now is uh, Ali Rafa to talk more about this. So, Ali, let's start with the allegations of discrepancies uh, we've heard since her testimony about the Secret Service account. Meadows and Giuliani are denying that they saw pardons. And the disagreement over who wrote the note. Former White House lawyer Eric Hirschman says he wrote the note. But at the end of the day, is Cassidy Hutchinson's credibility in jeopardy here? Or is this more a tactic to poke holes in her story? Well, in the committee's point of view, it's not. They say that they're still defending her, saying she's a credible witness, uh, that no matter what disputes uh, are really coming out of her testimony yesterday, they, at the end of the day, their argument still stands, that despite knowing that there was a potential for violence on January 6th, that Trump and his allies went forward with those plans anyway. And I also think it's important to mention, Tom, that this oh. is a 25-year-old at the beginning of her career who, who appeared publicly under oath and uh, you know, so many lawmakers applauded her for that yesterday, for her bravery and courage. And the, some of the people who are now disputing the claims she made yesterday are disputing them anonymously. So I think to the committee and uh, most of the American public, this is still standing by as strong, credible testimony. Uh, so I don't think it's surprising to see members, former members of the Trump uh, administration coming out and trying to debunk some of the claims that she made yesterday, Tom. All right. Now, well, Chairman Thompson made an interesting comment at the end of the hearing yesterday, basically opening the door to anybody else who would like to come forward, clear it all up, talk to them. Uh, Liz Cheney calling on White House counsel Pat Cipollone to testify. A person close to Cipollone said he's been cooperative with the committee, but then there are concerns over privilege issues, right? So could they realistically compel him to testify at this point? 
Yeah, and remember, that wasn't the first time we've heard her make a sort of not-so-veiled invitation for Cipollone to come forward publicly. She made it at the end of last week's hearing, one of the hearings from last week. And so we know that he's met privately with the committee uh, months ago. But as you mentioned, there are uh, he's citing privacy issues and privacy concerns as to why he doesn't want to do this publicly. Uh, today, Cheney quote, uh, tweeted, quote, as we heard yesterday, White House counsel Pat Cipollone had significant concerns regarding Trump's January 6th activities. It's time for Mr. Cipollone to testify on the record. Any concerns he has about the institutional interests of his prior office are outweighed by the need for his testimony. And there are several avenues the committee could go through to get him to talk on the record uh, publicly. But the concern is here, Tom, you know, remember that unofficial deadline of the midterm elections to get whatever argument the committee wants to make on the record before the American public, as well as the the Justice Department, who we know Attorney General Merrick Garland is watching these hearings. And so technically they could subpoena him. Uh, they could argue the fact that he does or does not have executive the right to claim executive privilege or privacy concerns with his testimony. But yet, at the end of the day, there is still that looming deadline, Tom. All right, Ali, thank you very much. Ali Roth on Capitol Hill for us. To the Supreme Court, where tomorrow, Katanji Brown Jackson officially takes over for Associate Justice Stephen Breyer, ending his 28 year term on the bench. The court will hold a small ceremony for the two at noon. Chief Justice John Roberts will administer the constitutional oath, and then Justice Breyer will give Jackson the judicial oath. Tomorrow is also the last day for decisions in what's been an, a landscape-altering and, at times, controversial turn for the court. We're still waiting on two more cases. We'll talk about them in just a minute. But let's start now with a big one today, a 5-4 to four ruling that's a blow to tribal sovereignty in this country. The court is siding with the state of Oklahoma, saying it shares jurisdiction with the federal government over crimes committed on reservations by non-Native Americans against Native Americans. Pete Williams joins us now with more on that. Pete covers justice and the Supreme Court. Pete, this case today basically narrows the Supreme Court's ruling from a, a couple of years ago on Native lands on Oklahoma, right? Right. It was a case from two years ago. It's a big deal in Oklahoma, Tom, because Oklahoma has six Indian reservations, six, six tribes, and a huge part of eastern Oklahoma, including part of Tulsa, is under their jurisdiction. So the question was, did the state have any authority to prosecute crimes on those lands? Two years ago, the state, the, the Supreme Court vastly cut it back. Today, as you described, the, the state, uh, the Supreme Court restored part of the state's jurisdiction, saying that when a non-Native American commits a crime against a Native American on those reservation lands, the state can prosecute. So this is, what, this is what the Republicans in Oklahoma had been urging the Supreme Court to do ever since that ruling two years ago. And today, by a 5-4 to four ruling, the court said, OK, you win. But kind of an interesting dissent here from Neil Gorsuch, right? Here's what he writes uh, in his dissent. He says, the court's decision here is not a judicial interpretation of the law's meaning. It is, in fact, the pastiche of a legislative process. So in layman's terms, Gorsuch is accusing the majority of making laws from the bench, which is a no-no, really, in traditional conservative circles. Right, and it's it's no surprising uh, no surprise that he's the dissenter here, since he wrote the majority opinion in the case two years ago that the court scaled back. But what the majority said today is, just because those reservation lands uh, are on uh, a federal reserve, they're still part of the state. The state retains jurisdiction because the federal government and the state never gave it away, and for that reason, Oklahoma can still prosecute those certain crimes on those tribal lands. Now, the tribes retain jurisdiction over crimes committed by tribal members on tribal land. This was about non-tribal members who commit crimes, but of course that could be a lot of people. All right, nobody watches the court closer than you do, and you're watching what tomorrow? We have two major cases, and we're going to talk about that. Walk us through what you're going to be watching. Sure, these are the last two of the term, and if they end up deciding both of them, and sometimes they hold cases over, but I think they will, the ones we're watching for is, first of all, how much authority does the Environmental Protection Agency have to restrict greenhouse gas emissions from coal-fired power plants? The Biden administration wants to move forward on this as part of its uh, green initiative. 
There's pushback from some conservatives on how far the EPA has the authority to do this. And lurking at the background in this case, Tom, is an effort by some of the conservatives on the court to limit not just the EPA's authority, but to say that federal agencies generally don't have power to take big steps unless they explicitly have authority from Congress. We'll see how far the court goes on that. And the second one is, did the Biden administration act properly when it tried to scale back a program to restrict immigration that was launched by the Trump administration. This was the so-called Migrant Protection Protocol, better known as the Remain in Mexico program, that said people seeking asylum in the U.S. couldn't wait in the U.S. or be released here. They had to be sent back to Mexico to wait for their uh, cases to come forward. So those are the last two cases of the term. And as you say, Justice Breyer steps down at noon. And then his first official act as a non-justice will be to swear in his former clerk, Katanji Brown-Jackson. Oh, well, that'll be a special day, special moment. Thank you, Pete. Pete Williams uh, covering that for us. Just a few hours ago, Texas Governor Greg Abbott again blamed the Biden administration for the deaths of 53 migrants believed to be human trafficking victims, saying that Texas is ready to take matters into its own hands. The way that the Biden administration is not enforcing the immigration laws is attracting people and, and enticing people to make this very dangerous trek. I urge the president, stop the loss of lives. Governor Abbott also announced Texas will be increasing border security, including more fencing on state and local property. We've seen the governor make his position on immigration central to his political campaign before he has sent state police to the border. In April, he even paid for buses to send these migrants to D.C. and then drop them off on the Capitol steps. On the ground, investigators are trying to identify the 53 people who died. Some were found with no IDs and what's believed to be the deadliest smuggling incident on the U.S.-Mexico border. NBC's Guad Venegas is in Eagle Pass near the border. Guad, walk us through Abbott's plans now to strengthen border security, what he's doing unilaterally in Texas. Uh, Tom, the governor spoke about what he wants to do at the border. As you mentioned, he wants to do this in land that is controlled by the state or by local authorities. He cannot do anything on federal land. And we understand, we know that Customs and Border Protection is in charge of patrolling the border, yet the governor has once again used state resources to patrol the border. Now, he announced he's creating two different strike teams of state troopers, uh, 22 troopers on each one of these teams, and the intention is for these teams to stop more migrants from crossing crossing the river into Texas. But in the grand screen, the scheme of things, if you look at the border, the size of Texas, uh, this is a very, very small resource. This is just uh, some additional help uh, of a problem that is affecting many cities along the Texas uh, Mexico border. I spoke to the sheriff here in Maverick County uh, who told me they don't have enough officers at a local level. And even with the help that's coming from state troopers, uh, he thinks they do need more help to control what is happening here um, at the border. For now, Greg Abbott uh, using more state resources to patrol the U.S. Mexico border, Tom. Yeah, but 44 state troopers, I, how much help is that really going to offer? I don't know. Listen, we know some of the victims were from Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, but it's proving really difficult to identify them. Is there anything else we know about who these people were? So you can imagine uh, with a lot of the migrants, when they travel, uh, not all of them have an ID or some type of document to identify them. Now, we know that most of the migrants are believed to be Mexicans because they are the ones that had IDs on them. Yet uh, Mexican officials have said that they still need to confirm that they are, in fact, uh, the people that were on those IDs. So what they've done in Mexico, they've put out uh, a, a lot of uh, messages to members of the community that think they might have family members who came to the U.S. Uh, essentially, they're asking anyone who's lost a family member who's believed to be in Texas, a migrant, to contact Mexican authorities in Mexico or even in the U.S. Uh, to see if one of those that died died in this tragic incident could be um, one of their family members. The same for people in Guatemala and also for people of uh, Honduras. Uh, some of the migrants were from those countries. So it's going to be a difficult job uh, that the consulates, uh, they're, you know, they're working on doing this, but it's not going to be easy to identify uh, all of those that died in that truck. Yeah, it's just awful. As you saw firsthand, we had a vigil last night, a lot of anger, a lot of anguish. This really cuts deep in this community, I'm guessing. 
Right, Tom. So uh, this incident happened in the outskirts of San Antonio in a road that is quite difficult to find. You have to really look for it. You have to use a GPS to get to the road. Yet a lot of members of the community made their way yesterday as members of the media were reporting they would walk up, leave flowers and cry. In fact, I walked up to a lot of them to ask if they were relatives. It, it you know, from the looks of it, a lot of them seem to have known some of these migrants and most of them said no. They just felt sad for what happened and, and they feel like this shouldn't be happening in Texas. Of course, there's different opinions on our immigration laws and what people are doing, the risks that they're taking to enter the country. But there's just a lot of sorrow in the community, while some organizations like Catholic Charities and others are trying to help the victims that are still in the hospitals. And now moving forward, as they identify the individuals, they'll have to help the families who will eventually uh, want to come to the U.S. To, uh, to see the bodies or to have the bodies be flown back to the country. So there's going to be a lot of work that has to be done and uh, a lot of help needed for these families, Tom. All right, Guad, thank you. NBC's Guad Benegas on the ground for us. Appreciate it, buddy. Uh, in Madrid today, President Biden had a clear message for Russia. Don't mess with NATO. The alliance is strong, united, and committed to defending member territory. Here he was earlier at one point saying that even though Russia has shattered peace on the continent, the U.S. and its allies are stepping up, so the president announced plans to seriously expand U.S. military presence across Europe, more troops, more air defense systems, more naval operations. The U.S. will also open permanent headquarters for the U.S. Fifth Army Corps in Poland. That's the first permanent U.S. force presence on NATO's eastern flank. But Ukrainian President Zelensky thinks NATO could be doing more. He asked for more advanced weapons, saying if NATO members don't help Ukraine defeat Russia, they could be next. NBC correspondent Kelly O'Donnell is traveling with the president in Madrid. Uh, and today, Kelly, President Biden and NATO said that they're sending an unmistakable message to Putin. What's the feeling, though, among NATO members there right now? Well, good to be with you, Tom. And there is definitely a sense that NATO is showing its strength by increasing its size, by inviting Sweden and Finland to join the alliance, moving it from 30 nations to 32 when that process is completed, and by asking the member nations to do more to fortify, especially the countries in Europe that border Ukraine and are within a sort of striking distance of Russia, to give greater deterrence and also defense to those countries, but to try to send that message to Putin. They say this is one of the most consequential meetings of the NATO alliance in the organization's history, and that they also believe it is important uh, to take this action, really the most uh, profound action since the end yeah. of the Cold War. So when you talked about some of those changes in American troop presence, some of that is taking what was temporary placement of U.S. troops in the first days and weeks after the Ukraine war started and making that a more permanent posture adding some troops, making those placements in countries like Poland and Romania longer-term presence, and something that the president feels will send a signal and will also help to coordinate American resources and military personnel with other members of NATO. And they're asking all the countries of NATO to contribute more. Tom? Uh, Kelly, can we look at this decision to put uh, this permanent U.S. military outpost headquarters in Poland? Because this is something that Russia had really been opposed to. How strategic was this decision to defy Moscow? Well, officials have told us that there was no warning given to Russia. Sometimes when these sort of military maneuvers happen, there is uh, kind of a country-to-country -country discussion of that behind the scenes to deconflict problems. That didn't happen in this case. And there has been an agreement that the U.S. would not have a permanent presence of combat forces. And the U.S. is telling us today, the officials that we talked to, that they don't view this placement as combat troops, not the type that are ready to go into battle, but a different kind of component uh, coming from headquarters. But it's still very much a U.S. presence on a permanent basis in Poland. And that is meant to send a signal to Putin and to Moscow. And if it makes them uncomfortable, that's part of the intention. President Biden believes this is the right step to take, 
and other NATO member countries are also in support of fortifying uh, the, the eastern flank in particular. And as you mentioned, President Zelensky talking about a warning to other nations about who could be next, what other countries could be vulnerable like Ukraine has been, and they're obviously going through this protracted, awful war. They want to try to put resources in place to make that harder for Russia to have any designs beyond Ukraine. Tom? All right, Kelly. Thank you. Kelly O'Donnell traveling with the president. Coming up, we're talking monkeypox and taking a look at the new plan from the White House to deal with an outbreak here in the United States. And House Speaker Nancy Pelosi received communion at the Vatican today. Why this holy sacrament story is really getting a lot of attention. Infections are rising again today. Right now, the government is sending 56,000 doses of the monkeypox vaccine to areas with the highest rates of transmission, including California, New York, Washington, D.C., and Florida. Another 240,000 doses will go out in the next few weeks, even more through the summer and into the fall. Health authorities are expecting to make at least 1.6 million doses available by late December. Now, we know New York and Washington have been struggling to roll out the shots. Those cities' health departments ran out of supplies to treat monkeypox less than a day after launching their local vaccine initiatives. We got new numbers right before we came on the air. The CDC now says 351 confirmed cases reported nationwide. That's 45 more than yesterday. CNBC's Meg Terrell is covering all of this, and she's joining us now. Uh, Meg, talk us through this right now. We have a, a two-pronged approach right now, right? We're the administration talking about focusing on getting the vaccines, also testing available to people, and, and trying to find the people who need it most. Talk us through this. Yeah, absolutely. It's really about expanding awareness, uh, both through communicating better with community leaders and practitioners and making sure there are more tests available so people actually know if they've been infected. And then, of course, the vaccination part of this, expanding vaccination to more people who are at risk. Whereas up to now, to be eligible for a monkeypox vaccine, you had to have confirmed exposure to a monkeypox case. Now they are saying that anybody with presumed exposure is now eligible. And really, this is focusing in on the community that's most at risk, men who have sex with men, and it includes people who either have had close physical contact with somebody who has a case of monkeypox or somebody who's had multiple recent partners in an area where monkeypox is known to be spreading. And the goal here really is to try to slow the spread, at least in this initial phase of the response. Okay, well, there's been criticism that the government has been slow to act on this or isn't doing enough. So what does the new plan tell us about the seriousness of the outbreak and the urgency it needs to be dealt with? Yeah, a lot of the criticisms we've been hearing here are just eerily reminiscent of the early days of COVID, that testing was too slow to get expanded. We had vaccines here, but there's a lot of criticism that they are too slow to be getting uh, out there to more people. Uh, but it sounds like the administration has heard that. They are reacting with a lot of urgency. A lot of different uh, elements of the government are involved in this response. So they are really talking about trying to get a handle on this, not just here in the United States, but contributing more globally to try to stop this in the countries where it's been endemic for a long time. Yeah, the National Coalition of STD Directors uh, said in a statement that the Biden administration, he believes the strategy is welcome. But there are still, I guess, questions about how the doses will make it to the most at risk in an equitable way. What other kind of actions do health groups want to see the administration move on? Yeah, certainly a lot more transparency on that. There's also just frustration that we have had vaccines for this, and still we are in a shortage situation right now. We are you know, still waiting for the FDA to inspect plants, for example. We need more of these vaccines to become available. And so I think what the communities are saying they want to see is transparency, speed, and they want to see us respond in a way that makes more vaccines available, not just here at home, but globally, and not to see a repeat of what we've seen with COVID, which unfortunately we are hearing a lot of sort of echoes of in this early response. Meg Terrell is the vaccine expert, and we are awfully fortunate to have her on CNBC <laughs> and available to us. Thanks, Meg. Appreciate it. All right, let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, 
20 men were convicted in the November 2015 Paris terrorist attack that killed 130 people and injured hundreds of others. The trial lasted 10 months. The main suspect behind the attacks was found guilty, sentenced to life in prison. Now, the attacks were the worst Islamist terrorist attacks in France's history and continues to shape French politics today. Number two, the U.S. economy shrank faster than expected at 1.6 percent during the first quarter. That is further sparking concerns about a recession. The government says the Omicron variant, along with the invasion of Ukraine, could be factors that attributed to the decline in the first quarter. Number three, Daily Harvest, a popular vegan food company, is being sued over illnesses linked to its lentils. Now, nearly 470 people have reported getting sick after eating lentil crumbles, but experts are really not sure why this is happening. Some people have reportedly suffered liver issues. The company issued a voluntary recall of that product to prevent further illnesses. Number four, the American Heart Association now considers healthy sleep patterns to be a key part of having a healthy heart and brain. The AHA says adults should average seven to nine hours of sleep a night, seven to nine. A study shows 80% of Americans here in the U.S. have low to moderate heart health. Number five, Snapchat introducing a new subscription called Snapchat Plus to spend more time on Snapchat. The service will cost $3.99 a month. It'll include exclusive features. Now the move comes after the company announced disappointing first quarter sales. More flight cancellations and delays across the country today. So far, more than 3,000 delays, nearly 600 cancellations, and most of these are what one airline executive calls blue sky cancellations, which means they're not being caused by necessarily the weather. What definitely is causing them, the pilot shortages. Almost every carrier saying that they simply don't have enough pilots to fill their schedules. And they don't expect things to get better anytime soon. The airlines cutting more than five and a half million seats through August. Coming up, privacy concerns are growing after several states have banned abortion. How tech companies are now working to ensure women's personal data on some tracking apps won't be used against them. And a big data breach in California impacting millions of gun owners. The personal information that was released on a state website when we come back. Good news if you're in California, California's governor just came out with a plan to send inflation relief payments to millions of taxpayers. We're gonna tell you who is eligible and how it's getting paid for just a little bit later. First up though, we're looking at how the ongoing battle over abortion is having a direct impact on one of the country's most prominent Catholics. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. She was at the Vatican today to meet with the Pope and to receive, receive Holy Communion. Mrs. Pelosi took part in the sacrament during a mass at St. Peter's Basilica. So you may be asking, what's the big deal here? She's Catholic, she's getting communion. But at home, she can't. The Archbishop of San Francisco, Salvador Cordeloni, Cordelone, sorry, blocking her from receiving the sacrament because of her support for abortion rights. Now, we should note that the Archbishop is a well-known conservative in the church who's had his own history of controversies. And we should also note that Pope Francis, who does uphold the church's opposition to abortion, says the Archbishops must welcome everybody to the church and not, quote, remain pinned to some of our fruitless debates. So, Sahil Kapoor is here to talk us through this. And Sahil, the, the reason we're talking about this is it reveals the issue not just for the speaker, but President Biden, the one that he's having, because he's also a devout Catholic, right? He also backs the party's stance on abortion rights. How is that going to play a role in how they navigate their party's efforts on abortion access, especially in an, in an election year? That's right, Tom. Well, the way they navigate it, both President Biden and Speaker Pelosi, is pretty simple. They talk about abortion not through the lens of their personal beliefs, but through what they believe should be legal in the United States. Their view is it doesn't matter what I think uh, about abortion, but all women have the right to choose uh, their own reproductive futures, and it should be up to women, uh, uh, along with consultation with their doctors, and if they pray, they're God. This has been a, a frustrating uh, 
subject for Speaker Pelosi, going back many years now, uh, given that there is a significant segment of the Catholic Church, most notably uh, senior bishops in the United States, who uh, don't, uh, who are not particularly welcoming to political leaders in particular who support abortion rights. And Pelosi has accused uh, some of those figures of holding a double standard. She, she notes that the church also teaches that the death penalty is bad, but they don't try to excommunicate or deny communion to politicians who support the death penalty. So a, a constant, you know, this is a very familiar territory for Speaker Pelosi. She's been down this road many times. Uh, yeah. She's answered many questions about this. And so has uh, President Biden. Yeah, my name ends in a vowel, so I've heard this debate up close and personal for quite a while. We've also seen the speaker welcome those who do not share her stance on abortion. Just a couple of weeks ago, she backed incumbent representative uh, Henry, Henry Quaylar, who was anti-abortion in his runoff against a progressive challenger. I is it fair to say the speaker believes Democrats need to make sure they don't alienate uh, pro-life, anti-abortion voters? It's possible, Tom, but I'm not really sure that's the reason she endorsed Congressman Cuellar. He is part of the club. He is an incumbent Democrat, and that t uh, tends to be enough to get you protection from Speaker Pelosi. Now, he is the only one Democrat in the entire House of Representatives who voted against the Women's Health Protection Act, which is a bill to codify the protections of Roe versus Wade. He's not a threat to it passing in the House of Representatives. And uh, Speaker Pelosi, as well as the rest of the Democratic leadership, endorsed him against a challenger, as they do members across the board, whether they're progressive or uh, more toward the moderate, the centrist wing, as uh, Congressman Cuellar is. So whether, you know, does Pelosi want to avoid alienating people who, uh, you know, have mixed views, have different views on abortion in the Democratic Party? Yeah. Probably yes. But she also recognizes that uh, 60 to 70 percent of the country wants abortion to be legal in all or most cases. I don't think she's particularly worried about uh, that 30 to 40 percent as much as she is abstractly uh, trying to convey that the Democrats are a big tent and they're not going to impose litmi uh, strict litmus tests. All right. We have a, a Pew poll, a recent Pew poll showing Catholics views on abortion really are more about party division than religion, right? Seventy three percent of Catholic Democrats say abortion should be legal in most or all cases compared to thirty nine percent of Catholic Republicans. They're also more likely to support abortion if a woman's life is threatened and less likely to believe that life begins at conception. Is that playing into how Democrats are broadly being more supportive of abortion rights right now? To a certain extent, Tom, but uh, the Catholics, American Catholics, are split right down the middle between the Democratic and the Republican Party. Just in the last election, President Biden uh, did maybe, uh, I believe, five to seven points better, according to uh, studies of that 2020 vote with American Catholics, did uh, improve what Hillary Clinton's performance was in 2016. But they're a, a very divided uh, community between the Democrats and the Republican Party. And American Catholics are also divided almost right down the middle in terms of whether abortion should be legal or illegal. So, you know, if the Catholic Church wanted to, to uh, keep out those who believe abortion should be legal, they would lose about half their membership in this country. It's a very, very split uh, a piece of uh, public opinion here. But public opinion on abortion has been sticky for quite some time. The big difference now, Tom, is the uh, those who support abortion rights are kind of woken up by the fact that all of a sudden, they you know, they woke up one day and it's no longer here. Many of them took that right. Women yeah. under... Uh, 50 had never been alive to, to experience a world like this. And we'll see where it leads. All right, Sahil, thank you. Uh, we appreciate all of your expertise on your insight from Capitol Hill. Thanks. Uh, there's a whole host of privacy concerns surrounding how tech companies can protect the data of users who are seeking abortions in a post row America. Just a few hours ago, Flow, a period and ovulation tracking app, announced it's launching a new feature called Anonymous Mode, which allows users to remove their personal identities from their accounts. That way, if Flow receives a request to identify a user by name or email, it will not be able to do that. Not all apps and websites are as secure. Planned Parenthood, a nonprofit organization that provides reproductive health care to women, left marketing trackers running on its scheduling pages. That means the website could share people's locations and in some cases, even the method of abortion one chooses with big tech companies. NBC's Kevin Collier joins us now to talk about this development. So, Kevin, how can people avoid leaving a digital trail if they are seeking an abortion and ensure that their health information is private? 
Well, one step is you can really just think about what would happen if I handed you my phone. You know, would you be able to log in for one thing? But then secondly, you could look through my text messages. You could look through what I had emailed. Now, if someone sets up, say, an encrypted messaging app like Signal and sets messages to disappear, uh, you know, you wouldn't be able to see it. But otherwise, everything you do is leaving a digital trail unless you're using a specific kind of, you know, either a browser that doesn't log your search history, search engine that doesn't track your um, your searches or messaging apps that don't track or that don't keep a, a, a record of the messages you send over time. This could be on any medical issue, right? Yes. What role are big, big tech companies playing right now uh, in protecting people's private medical data? And do HIPAA laws impact this at all or are we all vulnerable? Well, I mean, in the broad sense, we have no meaningful broad tech privacy law in this country. And there are so many companies that have so much information. There's very little that um, doesn't, you know, that, that is not. So Kevin, I think, Kevin, I think we've lost your mic. If it dropped off your uh, jacket, can you pick it up or have we lost you completely? All right, Kevin, we're going to take a break. We'll catch you on the other side. We want to hear the rest of your thoughts on this. Back in just a minute. All right, we tried to get Kevin Collier back, but his uh, the tech gremlins are still uh, really kind of after us. So if you want to read his reporting, go to NBCNews.com. Okay, now to the local, and NBC covers hundreds of stories each day. And because you couldn't possibly read, watch, or listen to all of them, our bureau teams have done it for you. And this is what they tell us is going down in their regions right now. In a segment we do call the local. From our Southeast Bureau, the three American tourists who were found dead at a Sandals resort in the Bahamas last month died from asphyxiation due to carbon monoxide poisoning. According to police, NBC News asked Sandals if the resort could, they could tell us more about the villas, if they had carbon monoxide detectors at the time, but Sandals did not directly respond to the question, saying it has, quote, fully supported the investigation and the case was an isolated incident. From our West Coast Bureau, caught on video, a man was gored by a bison at Yellowstone National Park. Ouch. Uh, the National Park officials say the man was walking with his family on a boardwalk when a bison charged at them. He was taken to a hospital in Idaho with an injury to his arm. It's the second incident this year of a bison gorging a visitor. Don't mess with him. Also from our West Coast Bureau, the California Department of Justice suffered a data leak revealing personal information of all concealed carry gun permit holders in the state. This includes the person's name, age, address, criminal identification number, and license type. The Fresno County Sheriff's Office says the DOJ pulled down the site after learning of the breach, but it is unknown exactly how long the information was available on the web. This time tomorrow, Israel will likely have a new leader. Uh, Yair Lapid, the country's foreign minister, will officially take over from Naftali Bennett to become prime minister of Israel. It's the country's fifth election in three years. And Lapid is a former TV news anchor who will be in this position temporarily until another set of elections happens later this year. But before then, he'll be the one to meet with President Biden as Biden makes his first trip to the Middle East, including a stop in Israel in just about two weeks. The upcoming elections are also clearing a path for the possibility of the former prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, returning to office. He's still currently facing corruption charges, which he's denied. But his right wing party is expected to remain the largest in parliament. NBC's Ralph Sanchez joins me now. So Ralph Lapid was actually supposed to become prime minister tonight. What more do we know about the timeline here? Yeah, Tom, Israeli politics is giving American politics a run for its money right now. The Israeli parliament was supposed to dissolve itself tonight, set a date for those new elections. That was looking so set in stone that the current prime minister, Naftali Bennett, actually went ahead and gave his farewell speech to the nation tonight. But then there was some last minute political wrangling, some brinksmanship. The vote got pushed back. We are expecting it to happen tomorrow. And Lapid to become prime minister either tomorrow night or 
Terror Friday. Now, Tom Lapid is an interesting character. He's the son of a Holocaust survivor. He is a high school dropout. And as you said, he was one of Israel's most popular talk show hosts. He was kind of a Stephen Colbert figure. He went into politics about 10 years ago. He's a centrist. He's a liberal. And when he becomes prime minister, he'll actually be the first Israeli leader from the center left for more than 20 years. But he's going to be in charge of kind of a caretaker government until that election happens, probably around Halloween. So, Tom, he's not really going to have much power to actually push through his agenda. So that'll be the sixth election then in, what, three years? Is that what we said? Uh, and President Biden headed there as part of his trip to the Middle East. What kinds of expectations are there, given the fact that Lapid would have just, as you said, just started the job? Well, for starters, Tom, the, the trip is going to go ahead as planned, which wasn't a total given, right? President Biden was expecting to land and meet Naftali Bennett. Now it looks like he's going to land and meet Yair Lapid. But the White House had planned for this. They were aware of the possibility the Israeli government could collapse. There could be some political chaos in this country. The feeling is Yair Lapid is somebody that President Biden can do business with. He's a centrist. He's someone who, like the president, agrees with the idea of a two-state solution. So you would have an independent Palestinian state alongside the state of Israel. And in terms of Israel's domestic politics, this may actually be a real boon for Lapid. He's somebody who's trying to burn his national security credentials. He's trying to show he can be a big figure on the world stage. And so a photograph of him with the president of the United States definitely can't hurt going into election season. Tom? All right. But uh, Benjamin Netanyahu waiting in the wings. How likely is it that he could, in fact, come back and become the prime minister yet again? Yeah, Tom, it's, it's a big but, and it's pretty extraordinary. Netanyahu is Israel's ultimate political survivor. The first time he became prime minister, Bill Clinton was in the White House. The second time he became prime minister, Barack Obama was in the White House. And the third time he may become prime minister, Joe Biden is in the White House. As you said, the polls are showing that his right-wing Likud party on course to win the most seats in the Israeli parliament. The election probably five months away, a lot could happen, but it's pretty striking that his his poll numbers are as strong as they are, given the fact that he is on trial right now for corruption charges. He's periodically showing up in a court in Jerusalem as a defendant, and yet it still looks like a very significant portion of the country is prepared to turn out and to make him prime minister once again. Tom, five months is a long time in Israeli politics. We'll see what happens. But Netanyahu certainly in a strong position to make yet another comeback. Tom? You're going to be busy for a few months. Thanks, amigo. Raf Sanchez, who's in Israel for us. Still ahead, a measure of inflation relief coming from millions of Californians. We'll tell you what they'll be getting, how much they're going to be getting when we come back. AAA predicting 42 million people will hit the road over the holiday weekend despite record high gas prices and inflation. But people in California who are paying the most in the country for gas, they're going to see some financial relief soon. Governor Gavin Newsom announcing a $17 billion inflation relief package that will include direct payments to about 23 million California residents. The amount between $200 and $1,050, depending on how much filers make a year, so how are they going to pay for it? Aha, the state actually has a budget surplus that it will use to finance the payments. Joining me now, NBC's Jake Ward, who I presume you're in San Francisco as always. All right, Jake, Californians are currently paying more than six bucks, right? I think 6.30 a gallon for gas. Republicans wanted the governor to suspend the state's gas tax. He said he wouldn't do that because it wouldn't help drivers enough. So they have a compromise, right? That's absolutely right, Tom. You know, at a time when my family is paying about $100 to fill up our car, we're actually set to see the tax on those fill-ups go up on Friday by about three cents a gallon. Republicans, as you mentioned, had wanted to bring that down and, in fact, suspend unleaded gas taxes. But the uh, administration here had essentially argued that that would not help, that we need that money to fund bridges, highways, and road construction. Uh, meanwhile, we're looking, you know, at this point at averages of, of $6 
$2.30. That number just continues to be a shocker every time you pull into the pump. But good news for long-haul truckers, because in October, we're looking at a suspension of the diesel gas tax, which hopefully will bring down the price of shipped goods, meaning mm. that we will pay less for that as well. So a lot going yeah. on here, Tom. I'm guessing you don't drive a Winnebago, right? What are you in, a Prius or a Toyota or something that you Californians love? I wish I could say I had that kind of car. I drive a Toyota Highlander, and it sucks an extraordinary amount of gas. I bought it at a very different era, and so, yeah, <laughs> yes. I'm regretting that choice, yes. as I do so many of my <laughs> yes, choices you these did. days. <laughs> All right, well, talk to us about the rollout for the stimulus, then. Who gets, well, how do they decide who gets how much money? Well, as with any stimulus along these lines uh, here in California, it's aimed at the people that it can benefit the most. And so in this case, we're looking at a, a sort of a slicing of it up uh, depending on your income and how uh, big your family is. For individuals mm. who make less than $75,000 a year, we're looking at a rebate of about $350 that will start arriving as a direct deposit uh, later this year. Uh, if you make uh, under $125,000, it's $250. Bucks. Under $250,000, it's $200. Bucks. And when you look at people who are married, you're essentially just doubling those figures. A married couple that makes less than $150,000 is going to get about $700 and so on. And the number goes up by a few hundred dollars, Tom, if you do have dependents that you can add to your tax filings. And so uh, larger yeah. families hopefully will benefit from this over time. You can add me if you need to. Uh, listen, some economists, as you know, they warn that this relief could actually make inflation worse, right? So what's the thinking here? It's difficult, right? I mean, you and I have covered the economy for a long time, and the weirdest part, I think, for me in this moment is that I'm being reminded just how adversarial supply and demand really is. In a way, the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates in order to make it harder for you and yeah. I to spend money, right? It's more expensive to borrow money over time. It's a weird thing to think about. And in this case, what Governor Newsom is doing here, academics say, is in fact sort of uh, in competition, in conflict with what the Fed is after. And so um, the worry is that by giving people this extra, let's say, $1,000, you're going to encourage them to spend that money. The supply, mm -hmm. which is the problem here, won't be able to keep up with that, and inflation will continue. But, of course, administration officials here in California say this is a one-time injection of money. It's not ongoing, and it's at a time when people really need it. What we're basically seeing here, Tom, is that you certainly can't take the academic theories that drive Federal Reserve policy and turn them into politics. It's bad politics to say to people, we're going to try and slow your spending down, your ability to spend down. And here, this is definitely going to be both politically popular and hopefully help people at the, the, the pumps over the coming weeks. Tom. All right. NBC's Jake Ward uh, in the Golden State. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. That is a wrap for this hour. We're going to have much more for you here tomorrow. Same time, same place. Coverage, though, picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.